Welcome to this webinar. Before we begin the presentation, I want to provide you with a few housekeeping items. On your screen, you will see a taskbar with icons. Each icon is assigned to a particular element of today's webinar. Click on the person icon to learn more about today's speakers. Throughout the presentation, you can network with others or submit questions to the speakers in the Q&A and chat box next to the slides. Download resources from the cloud icon. After the webinar is over, please take our survey to tell us how we did. Today's event is being recorded and archived and will be available within 24 hours. For on-demand questions or comments, send us an email by clicking Need Help? Email us. If you experience any technical issues today, please refresh your browser by hitting F5 for PC or Command R for Mac. And now I'm excited to turn it over to today's moderator. Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar, Becoming an Expert in Air to Water Heat Pumps. This event, brought to you by the ACHR News, is sponsored by Intertech. I'm your moderator, Kyle Gargaro, Editorial Director of the News. Thanks for joining us today. Today's presenters are Tim Wright, Vice President of Sales, and Jeff Hammond, Vice President of Technical Services, both with Intertech. Tim oversees the company's customer solutions and sales department. He, he serves on the Board of Directors for the California Geothermal Heat Pump Association and the Virginia Geothermal Heat Pump Association. Jeff is responsible for Entertech's technical service and training departments, design services, and technical literature. He serves on IGSPA and CSA committees and is a member of ASHRAE. Don't forget to submit your questions and later in the program, Tim and Jeff will address as many as possible. Today's event is being recorded and archived on achrnews.com backslash webinars. And now I'm excited to turn it over to our first presenter. Go ahead, take it away, Tim. Thank you, Kyle, and welcome, everybody. Depending on, on where you're coming from, I'll say good afternoon. Thank you very much for taking time to join Jeff Hammond and I today. And this is just the, the beginning of a conversation. So you know, please walk with us as we move through this presentation today. But as Kyle just said, becoming an expert in the air to water, we do not believe that that is going to happen in one hour. But we're asking you to join us on this journey because the air to water industry is relatively new to the United States and Canada. However, it has been vastly used for a decade or longer over in the European markets. So please understand that we have taken this to task. And we're very excited about this opportunity to share the advantage benefits with you today. So thank you for joining us. So real quick, I'm going to get moving here with what are we going to do and what are we going to talk about today? So the air to water, we're going to roll through the product features of the advantage system. Jeff Hammond is going to share with you applications, proper applications. We'll also provide a technical overview for you today. We're going to take a look at some operational cost, and we've really keyed in on four different regional zones, if you will, across both Canada and the United States, just in case we have some of our Canadian friends joining us today. And then we're going to take a, a look at some field installations, just to kind of give you a better picture of what the equipment actually looks like, what type of space does it entail, and then we're going to obviously hit through the performance numbers. And then we're obviously excited about the question and answer period that we'll have with each of you today. So I'm going to run away here. So let's just set the stage, if we will. As I mentioned before, as you take a look back through even what's happened over in Europe, greatly advanced in the air to water, as well as the geothermal. But if you just take a step back in time with me in the United States and Canada, as you all know, extreme cold temperatures, the air source heat pump industry struggled uh, in order to just even gain traction, in order to be able to have the performance over time. And as things have gotten better, the air source industry has vastly improved, obviously heading toward variable speed technology, inverter driven variable speed technology. So with the advent of air to air moving along nicely, obviously the air to water product has come along nicely as well with its advancements and we're excited to share that with you today so when we talk about your opportunity we're really encouraging you 
to open up your mind. You may be here joining us on this webinar today, and you don't even, you've not installed an air to water before, or you may not even have heard of the technology. However, there's also many of you that have done hundreds, if not thousands of these here in the United States or Canada. So please understand that it is more than just HVAC. And Jeff will start to unpack this for you. But being on the leading edge of electrification, I don't think any of us can, can open up our computers or open up a newspaper and not hear the word decarbonization or not hear the word electrification. So just encouraging you to have all the tools available to you with all the technology that's available to you today. So obviously we're trying to just make sure that this is seen as an opportunity for you so that you can gain that understanding and then obviously that market share will become yours along with every opportunity. And we're trying to make sure that this is obviously an accessible solution. It is a whole home solution or even a whole building solution. So please keep in mind, it just starts to separate based on the application. But Jeff is gonna share with you what our design team is able to assist you with today. As I mentioned earlier, just to quote a few numbers here, 1.7 million annual units of the air to water technology in Europe and across China. And obviously that's looking at the global market. So the East Coast, specifically Northeast and Northwest, this product is taken off already as a beautiful little opportunity you see on the right hand side. If you have a boiler opportunity or a boiler system, this is a wonderful little addition, if you will, or potentially a replacement. So we have a solution, whether you want to head toward all electric, or if you still want to keep some type of fossil fuel option available to you as well. So again, this really only alternative prior to air to water were boilers with no good electric choice. Well, that time has changed and please join us as we move through this. So why air to water? Let's just even look at that from a perspective of complete efficiency and performance. So not all installations have an opportunity for a ground loop. Many of the, of the, the urban markets, there's just no opportunity to achieve maximum efficiency, performance, and comfort. But yet we also highlight on your second bullet point, customers want more than just what an air source heat pump offers. Even though they're incredible efficiencies, they still don't have the ability to address domestic hot water. And you'll see that coming up shortly. Again, the push for electrification and renewables, the elimination of the fossil fuels. Again, that is happening all across the United States and Canada as we speak. And this is a wonderful product to integrate with solar. When you are all electric, you now have the opportunity to generate kilowatt hours in reverse, if you will, by the sun's solar energy or the radiant energy that we can get back to head toward a net zero or head toward if there's the passive home building community paying attention to this product as well. So we'll spend a little bit more time on that. Hydronic heating and cooling naturally lends itself to zoning. Obviously an incredible opportunity to be able to break that apart and just have every room treated or every zone treated a little bit differently than the other, again, for maximum comfort and efficiency. Radiant floor and or forced air, you will see, and Jeff will show you that this can be radiant floor while it's doing domestic hot water, or your potable water, but you can also head toward a hydronic coil or an air handler that would give you that opportunity to have chilled water for air conditioning or warm water, if you will, for your forced air heating. So all of this with the operational down to minus 13 degrees Fahrenheit outside. And again, Jeff will share a little bit more on that for our Canadian friends, that's minus 25 degrees Celsius. So still very good performance, even at those extreme low temperatures, all thanks to the vapor injection. So here's the question. Do you currently install hydronic systems? This is one thing that we're encouraging you, please reach out and uh, engage with us. And this is an interactive poll opportunity. 
And with that, we're just trying to figure, is the HVAC industry opening its mind, opening its eyes to people truly wanting just more than heating and air through forced air? But we're also seeing our people heading toward a, a whole comfort solution being hydronics. So what I'm seeing right now, interesting, Jeff. Uh, if As I see the numbers uh, still come in, uh, it's kind of like, like watching uh, the, the, the presidential election here back and forth, but we're seeing about 56, 57 percent already doing hydronic systems. Any comments on that, Jeff, with what you see? I think that's encouraging. It's it's the most comfortable system available. So it looks like uh, we already have some of that happening. The air to water heat pump makes a nice mix with what they're already doing. Mm -hmm. Right on, Jeff. Well, it's interesting. And first of all, thank you for the 54% that have said yes. You're opening up those opportunities for your customers. For those 46%, yeah, there, there's, I'm sure, a myriad of reasons why you, you've been honest with us and saying no. It might just be your area. Um, I'm personally sitting here in uh, Austin, Texas today, and there's hydronic tubing being installed as we speak even in a lot of these southern markets, all based on comfort. So, again, just consider Entertech your partner in, in helping you learn and achieve on where we can go next to help you be able to offer hydronic systems. So just moving through, again, just as a wrap-up, 55% was our total poll of yes. Obviously, 44% in that range, 45 would be no. So excellent. Great stuff. Thank you very, very much. That interaction helps Jeff and I. So as we move here, so what are we doing with this product? And Jeff is getting ready to give you some numbers as well as take you through. But what this system can do, again, sized, designed, and engineered properly, up to 100% of your domestic hot water needs. It also gives you the forced air, heating, and cooling functionality that many of you, obviously, the 55% or beyond, are already doing every day, but the radiant floor heating is an absolute beautiful opportunity to be able to get into that comfort side. Um, so it's kind of funny, Jeff, I know we dubbed this as mechanical room in a box, but I think it's a great opportunity now to maybe just segue over to you and allow you, Jeff, to be able to take people through a little bit more specifically on what it looks like and how it performs. Great, thank you, Tim. As, as Tim mentioned, uh, zoning is just great with uh, hydronic systems. And uh, up to this point, we had uh, some choices in the market, you know, water-to-water -water heat pumps with, with geothermal, certainly is a choice that Intertech already has. But um, if we're looking at hydronic with boilers, we don't get cooling. So the one opportunity we have with, with zoning and an air-to-water heat pump is we can still do all the hydronic systems um, that, that we might have done with a boiler. We do have to watch water temperatures, and I'll get into that here shortly. But uh, we have the capability of doing radiant floors, Tim mentioned, uh, even some really nice decorative uh, low-mass baseboard and, and wall-type hydronics. You see in the picture there, the second from the left, we can do forced air uh, heating as well as cooling uh, with an air handler that's designed for the temperatures uh, that a heat pump would typically deliver. And on the far right, uh, domestic hot water really is a, an enormous savings with the type of COPs that we're working with, uh, with, with any heat pump, but in particular this air to water unit is really designed for, um, for heating and for hot water. It does a great job of cooling. But, it's, but you'll see some of the numbers here on, on how it performs extremely well in uh, heating and hot water. Just as a comparison, Tim mentioned uh, air source heat pumps and how far they've come. They've, they really have got, gotten to be more and more efficient all the time. But one of the advantages of the air to water heat pump is that it is a heating design product. So you can see these COP comparisons. The gray line is a 19 sear air source heat pump. And the blue line is the Intertech air to water heat pump. It, you know, air to air to air heat pumps certainly are very efficient. Once you get down below zero, you get to a point where your COP might not be any better than just straight resistance, uh, COP of one. 
if it's a product that's designed specifically for low temperatures and is specifically designed for heating, as you can see from that blue line, even at minus 13 Fahrenheit, uh, we still have a COP of 2.2. And I've always looked at heat pumps as, um, uh, from a you know design standpoint, where do we want to turn it off? If our COP is around one, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to run that heat pump. But if we can stay in the in the two range or so, then uh, we're, we're better off making heat with the heat pump. I shouldn't say making heat; we're transferring heat. Then we are switching over to electric heat. Compared to boiler efficiencies, you see there in the red. Of course, those are always below 100% efficient. Uh, unless some some uh, new technology comes out, but I would doubt if physics would allow that. So we're with a COP of um, that we're looking at here. We're significantly more efficient than boilers, but we're even uh, quite a bit more efficient than than the highest air source heat pumps, and that's because of its design specifically for this application. When we look at capacities, same thing. Because this is a heating uh, designed unit, the blue line you see uh, going at an angle there is the heat load of the space. In orange is the air to water heat pump versus the 19 sear heat pump in gray. And so where that line, the blue line crosses the, um, the the line, either air source or the air to water heat pump, is the balance point. The farther out we can go on the balance point, the less backup heat we need. So having higher capacity at those colder temperatures is a pretty big deal. In fact, uh, you can see here we, we gain somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, between five and, and seven degrees versus even the highest efficiency air source heat pumps where we can hold on until colder temperatures before we need any backup heat. When you look at specific numbers, this is, happens to be the five ton uh, advantage air to water heat pump. Uh, we can then start dialing in on water temperatures. Of course, the best system is going to be the system that, we're, that uses the lowest water temperature. That's why radiant floor works so well. The lower the water temperature of the heat pump, the higher the COP. And the same goes with, with um, um, you know, with, with designing any system, whether it's an air to water, whether it's a water to water. We want to try to, to design that um, system with, with the lowest possible um, uh, water temperatures. We do get a little bit higher capacity uh, with higher water temperatures. You can see here the black line is 131 degrees Fahrenheit. The blue line is uh, 95 degrees, so that might be a radiant floor. And the red line is somewhere in the middle, uh, which may be a, a forced air zone we might use a fan coil for. So our higher capacities are great for domestic hot water use. Uh, we would want higher temperatures typically with domestic hot water, but if we don't need it, we might as well take advantage of, of the blue line and have higher efficiencies. So this is its companion chart. You can see the, um, the blue line is our typical radiant floor uh, curve, which might even be higher if we can go less than 95 degrees with outdoor temperature reset, which I'll talk about here shortly. Uh, if we're doing domestic hot water, then we're probably looking at that black line. But even with domestic hot water, you can see the COP is somewhere around 1.8 at, at its coldest temperature where it's going to operate. And those are the things we can talk about when we're looking specifically at design applications for this product. How do we do it? We're using a variable speed scroll with vapor injection. The two charts you see here, two, two uh, graphs actually on, on the chart, show an Ultratech two-stage scroll. That would be a typical heat pump compressor, and it's, it's used you know, very, very widely in the industry. The vapor injection scroll is designed for much colder evaporating temperatures. So we're able to run way down at those cold temperatures and still have very good capacity and very good um, efficiency. It's it's really like a turbo boost almost. Uh, it's it's a little counterintuitive. It's cooling the compressor down, but that's what it's designed to do. So when we have very very cold temperatures outside and we have very warm temperatures inside, uh, I should say water temperatures, then that vapor injection helps keep that that compressor run into the temperature where it's going to be most efficient and have the highest capacity. So it's pretty neat technology with vapor injection. Tim mentioned uh, the mechanical room in a box, and that's one of the things that's quite different uh, with this unit. Our competitors do have air-to-water air equipment out there. Uh, it's an outdoor unit, not a whole lot different than the Intertech uh, product, although we think we have a lot more um, features and benefits and make it easier to install. 
the indoor module is really the key. I'm showing my age here with this uh, picture of the Erector set. I loved playing it with it as a kid, but that's what's happening in most cases with our competitors. Uh, the outdoor unit is shipped, and then the indoor portion of it has to be designed in the field. So that can be pretty labor intensive, but it also uh, requires multiple trips to various wholesalers and, and a lot of time that could be used on the next job. So that is something that's quite a bit different that we'll see here in this next slide uh, versus the competitors. We're providing both the outdoor unit and the indoor unit. And that's really for time savings, but it's also for compatibility. Uh, when you have a match system, it's going to be much uh, better performance as well as um, you know, being able to control the temperatures, the, the flow rates, and so forth. So if you're looking on the left-hand side, that's the outdoor unit with the covers removed. Uh, you, you see here the uh, vapor injection variable speed scroll compressor as well as um, where the refrigeration circuit is. There's a refrigerate, refrigerant heated condensate pan so that any condensate um, uh, that, that's coming off of the coil is, is not going to freeze um, before it ex 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 exits the unit. ECM fan, of course, keeps the system very efficient and extremely quiet. You can barely hear this, this uh, unit run. It's a monoblock design, so one of the best things about that is we don't have any refrigeration piping. We're just running uh, water piping, whether it be PEX or copper, from the outdoor unit to the indoor module, which is in the center of the, uh, the slide here and what we're calling the mechanical room in a box. So you can see in the center of the, of the slide an expansion tank. There are actually um, flush ports, so we're able to purge air from the system. Variable speed internal pump. We have a, either an electric backup heater, there's an immersion heater, uh, in, uh, that's that gray bar in the center of the screen, uh, or we can go with dual fuel and energize a boiler for backup. Uh, one of the big labor savings are these bypass valves. You can see a red device. Um, th those are the zone valves that will switch between heating and domestic hot water, as well as an, an internal uh, pressure differential bypass valve. So we're able to do all of that inside the box and save quite some time uh, with not only piping, but uh, sourcing components and so forth. The controls you see at the top are designed to interface uh, directly with that outdoor unit. So there's a communication uh, cable between the two pieces. That gives us the ability to do outdoor temperature reset, to um, provide information about the outdoor unit on, on the screen. Uh, that's a touch screen, color screen on the indoor module. So having this package together is a huge labor saving, but it's also great for compatibility and um, the ability to add more features that you couldn't do with um, trying to source all this, uh, all these components separately. On the far right, we, we show the uh, TurboMax indirect water heater, which is what we're using with this product. It's backwards from most indirect water heaters in that we have the heat pump load water in the tank and we have the domestic water circulating through the heat exchanger. So that gives us a lot more mass to work with. And even though we can provide up to 135 degree water leaving this heat pump, we're still not running at 160 or 180 degree water like a boiler might. So having this reverse piping gives us a huge advantage and, and makes uh, heat pump water heating really, really advantageous from a cost standpoint. So you put all this together, the outdoor module, which is, again is available from other companies, uh, but then when you couple it with the indoor module that is specific to Intertech and the TurboMax water heater, uh, we have a very, very neat mechanical room, uh, huge labor savings, and, and really a matched system. So on that note, we have another poll question here. What do you think of the, the future is for air to water heat pumps? You know, we're obviously pretty excited about it, but uh, it depends on, on your perspective as to what you think the future is, what your experience is with, with hydronics and so forth. So are they going to be uh, increasingly more popular? Is it a fad? And we're, we're just excited about nothing. Will we start to see heat pumps offered as an alternative to boilers? Uh, you know, we certainly hope so. Or is it just something that um, works in the south but doesn't work well in colder climates uh, because of the outdoor temperature? We'll give this a few minutes because uh, it looks like we're getting a lot of, a lot of good responses here. Uh, most people are, are thinking that they're going to become more popular. 
Uh, nobody thinks it's a fad. I guess that's a, a good sign. Maybe maybe we went down the right path here, and uh, we have some people that are um, seeing some alternatives to boilers. We'll give it a few more minutes here. It, it is new technology in North America, as Tim mentioned. It's it's not uh, there hasn't haven't, hasn't been product here, but there hasn't been a lot of product that is uh, that gives you choice, and especially. Um, with the indoor portion of it, that has been uh, a challenge for not only components, but all the piping controls and, and so forth. I think we're just about wrapped up here. Tim, any comments on this? No, Jeff, I just, I love what's happening in the numbers here. So you've really got about 91% that are starting to, to come around to the idea of an alternative to boilers and indicating that this is going to increase in popularity. That's phenomenal. Great. All right. I think we'll wrap it up then. All right. So here's our uh, our final summary. About 60% uh, think, think they're going to be coming increasingly popular, and then 30% uh, are seeing it as an alternative to the boiler. So, so that's a good sign, as Tim mentioned. All right. A little bit more on the technical side. We've talked about some of the features. But uh, this is what you're going to want to know as you're installing this product. Uh, you know, what do you have to plan for in the installation? One of the really nice features is the outdoor temperature reset uh, with 15 curves. So you can choose the curve that makes the most sense for your climate. And as I mentioned earlier, the lower the water temperature we can use, the more efficient it is. So if we don't need 110 degree water running through the floor, you know, we might want to try uh, 85 degrees or even 80 degrees, depending upon the outdoor temperature. With an outdoor temperature reset curve, we can choose what our maximum water temperature should be when it's at design temperature and what our other temperatures are when it's milder. That's really where we're going to maximize the efficiency, and that's built in uh, to the control, another advantage of, of having the two pieces uh, packaged together. The outdoor temperature up to 100, or excuse me, the output temperature up to 135 degrees Fahrenheit that is a big benefit for domestic hot water. So we may not need 135 degrees, but it's available if we need it. And that will be uh, used primarily for, for domestic hot water. It certainly could be used for other applications if, if desired. Um, we typically don't use them for that high of a temperature for a fan coil because the Intertech fan coils are designed for 120 degree water. So again, uh, from an efficiency standpoint, let's use 120 degrees instead of 135 degrees and maximize the COP for the unit if we can match that with an Intertech fan coil. And, and then we reserve those higher temperatures for domestic hot water or potentially for other applications if we're careful uh, and we have you know, some baseboard or some um, uh, radiator type applications as long as we know what the performance is since we typically have much, much higher temperatures with radiator type applications. So we do have to be careful if we're going to use that for, for that type of an application. Zone controls are available for both radiant floor and fan coils. There's a really nice startup wizard. As you start up the unit on the touch screen display, uh, it will check, make sure everything is working, and even checks to make sure that there's minimum flow uh, provided to the unit. So if it's not seeing uh, the minimum flow requirement, it won't let that startup wizard go further. There's a really nice uh, fail safe for boiler backup. If for some reason uh, a pump fails or something else happens, the boiler is the default um, output. So we're not in a situation where they have no heat. Load shed or utility dual fuel programs are, are really becoming um, popular in some states. So that, that's built into the controls. It, in some cases, the utility cost, the kilowatt hour cost, it's half of what it would be uh, with an electric system. So if we have a, a situation where we have a dual fuel program, you're able to take advantage of that just simply by ordering a different indoor unit that has the boiler output. Uh, the, the next point here, refrigerant pressures and temperatures and uh, water temperatures, that is a huge time savings and uh, also makes it much, much easier for troubleshooting. All that's displayed on the indoor color touchscreen. And quite a lot of uh, information as far as uh, installation, application, wiring diagrams, that kind of thing, that's all available on the uh, Intertech website, uh, downloadable documents. 
Some additional technical information I mentioned earlier, the monoblock design. This is not a split system, so we're not running any refrigerant piping. And that is really a big advantage from a uh, quality standpoint, but also a, a long-term reliability standpoint. This product is built in our factory in Mitchell, South Dakota. It's uh, leak checked, it's uh, run tested even at the factory before it leaves. So you can't do that very easily with a split system. We know when this product leaves that it's already able to make hot water and chilled water. And we talked a lot about the package earlier. Having that indoor module, it could be as much as two days labor savings by the time you add all the parts and pieces uh, together. Uh, so your only connections really are your piping to and from the outdoor unit, the piping to and from your TurboMax tank, and typing, piping to and from the hydronic manifolds or the fan coil. Those six connections are what you're going to connect to the indoor module. And from there, it's like any other boiler system or um, hydronic system. We do attempt to make sure that you're not making multiple trips. Uh, so the hydronic specialties, which is the expansion tank and so forth, those are shipped with the unit. Most of them are inside. If you remember the picture earlier, there's an expansion tank inside that indoor module. And then uh, zone valves are built into the indoor module. I mentioned earlier we can choose a dual fuel if we have a, a boiler backup if we have dual fuel, or there's a 9 kW immersion heater that's available for an all-electric system. The pump is variable speed inside that module. Uh, it's a Grunfoss UPMXL, very efficient, and will uh, change based upon delta T control. And then to make uh, make things easier, we're not we don't have a whole lot of wiring between the two units. It's just a three conductor wire to communicate between the indoor and the outdoor sections. Applications become a lot easier when we have all that packaged. In this particular one, we have an all electric system. So you can see here the indoor module is piped to a hydraulic separator. That is the most popular um, application. If we have some really small zones, especially on the air handler side we may need a buffer tank. But in the case of um, most systems, a hydraulic separator is adequate because that variable speed compressor can turn down to 25%. So you see in this particular application, some radiant zones, an air handler zone. Of course, we have the domestic out water, and in this case, we have a backup uh, water heater as well. If we go dual fuel, uh, by piping that boiler in, and it may be a combi boiler, like the one in the picture here, where we're also providing some hot water, uh, that can be controlled by the indoor module. So it will send a, a signal to the boiler whenever the boiler needs to come on. And at that, I will turn it back over to Tim for discussion on operating costs. All right. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, what we did here is I mentioned earlier at the top of when we got together that we were just going to look at four different kind of regional areas. So please take a look, and we're drawing your attention to Syracuse, New York. And what we've tried to do here is just build out what we would typically see in the competing marketplace. So you have the advantage on the far left, and then we also gave you a perspective of 95% gas, 13 sear air conditioner, 95% propane, same, 13 sear air conditioner, 80% fuel oil, 13 sear. And then as Jeff uh, showed you in his diagram and chart, we also wanted to compare it to high efficiency, high end air source heat pump, so we chose a 19 sear there. So just taking a look across the board, how well does the advantage perform looking at a specific target market? And this is where we have come up with. So, you know, Jeff, it's interesting to, to watch the, the four areas we've taken. I believe the advantage comes out on top at least three, F, if not uh, three out of four. So um, incredible opportunity. Just pay attention to how it performs on the heating side. The air conditioning side, it certainly holds its own, as well as good dehumidification, but also pay attention, as Jeff said, the heating and the domestic hot water. And you see how little that we can look after the domestic or the potable water in Syracuse, New York, with the Advantage product, and that is a per year. This is what uh, we're showing you here. So very, very good in a cold weather climate. Now, let's go north of the border, again, to our Canadian friends. And again, we've kept the same format along the bottom. And here, once again, the advantage is the lowest cost for heating, space heating, if you will, or hydronic heating, as Jeff mentioned, as well as the least amount for your domestic hot water. 
And again, very little cooling load, if you will, in the Quebec City area. So again, wonderful opportunity there. Let's head to Minneapolis. Again, back to another cold weather location. And uh, this is where we love to have truth in numbers. And Jeff will share with you on this design tool how you can actually do this yourself uh, through Entertech. But the advantage here, we, we actually got beat out a little bit because of some, I'll say, inexpensive natural gas. Um, we don't think that would last forever. But again, as people start to head toward decarbonization or electrification, what a wonderful opportunity to still be that close, neck and neck, if you will, from an annual perspective on your heating, cooling, and hot water. Again, I challenge you to take a look at that domestic hot water. It's even less than, if you will, uh, what you see with the 95% gas and, and 13 SEER. So very, very good, but we always want to give you truth in numbers so that you have a very good perspective of where this truly fits in the marketplace. And we're going to give you one more here, and we're going to head to Seattle. We wanted to do kind of a northeast and a northwest. And again, the Advantage does remarkably well on the heating side. Um, again, a very moderate climate, if you will. So the 19 SEER certainly beats us out on the heating side. However, take a look at the domestic hot water. And again, very little cooling. So Overall, it still comes in as number one, but just take a look and we'll be happy to share this slide deck with any of you folks and look at your specific market area. So let's just head toward the next polling question I believe is, is uh, right upon us. What do you think is the most efficient system for radiant floor systems? So what do you think is the most efficient system for radiant floor systems, fuel oil boiler, natural gas boiler, air to water heat pump, or electric boiler. All right, Jeff, there's an awful lot of people paying attention today. This is fun. Um, excellent. We love to see these results come in. And the one thing that I, I would just like to touch on, because Jeff and I have been in this industry a long time. We won't give years to date ourselves, but we understand that having fantastic technicians and fantastic installers is really a premium. And I love, you know, Jeff's picture of the erector set. And your team, the time is much better spent to be installing and screwing an indoor module to the wall or working on an entirely separate project than having them put flange kits together and pumps together and plumbing together where we really wanted to try to bring you that solution of all-in-one mechanical room in a box. So, uh, Jeff, I, I love these numbers. Uh, any comment on your side? Yeah, one of the things, Tim, to, to uh, keep in mind, uh, those charts um, showing Minneapolis, that's an all-electric system, and that's one state where there are some really attractive dual-fuel utility rates. So if we were to rerun that with um, with a particular utility that had that dual fuel rate, it would look like the other three graphs. So, you know, like you said, truth in numbers, we want to show how, how that all electric system compares, but that, that's most likely why we're seeing some um, different numbers here. Natural gas might be less in some areas, so we want to make sure we use the tools we have in software to find out what makes the most sense for that particular area. Yeah, very good, Jeff. Thank you for bringing that up. And multiple states have a dual fuel rate where it becomes highly advantageous to, to keep your existing system to your point and then still add on for the major benefits of something like an Advantage air to water heat pump. Okay, so let's move. I think we've given that enough time. Again, thank you all. Your uh, participation is phenomenal, makes it a lot more fun for Jeff and I. But 75% air to water heat pump you believe is the most efficient for radiant floor systems. Wow, thank you, that, that's great information. Natural gas boiler, 21%. Uh, again, we'll be happy to share uh, a little bit more design information where you can actually do this analysis you know, with us and through us on your behalf for your specific market. So we'll be very happy to do that. So let's move along, but uh, you know, great insight. Thank you everybody for for taking time to uh, to do those polls with us. So, Jeff, I'm going to turn it back over to you, sir. 
All right, thank you, Tim. And that's a good segue uh, when we talk about those operating costs. We, we do want to look at some of the resources that are available through air, uh, through Intertech for these air-to-water heat pumps. Uh, one of the resources that we're really proud of is our uh, technical services department. Uh, you can see the gentleman here. We have actually another person starting uh, shortly. And uh, we have a lot of experience uh, in our technical services department. We work hand-in-hand -hand with engineering as these new products are being developed so that we can stay up to date with uh, with all the information that is necessary to support customers. We do have two different market channels. Um, we will support our distributors uh, as much as we can, certainly. So for contractors who work through distributors, that then uh, you know we'll, we'll work with your distributor to help out however we can. There are some customers where we don't have distributors, and, uh, and we have a dealer direct uh, network there as well. So those uh, gentlemen are available from um, 8 in the morning Eastern time or 7 Central time uh, through 5 o'clock Central or um, 6 o'clock Eastern time. And, uh, and they're, they're, like I said, very, very knowledgeable and helpful in, in all the applications, not just air to water, but also our geothermal product. In design services, same setup. We have two different market channels. So depending upon whether you buy through a distributor or it's a dealer direct channel, uh, those uh, Resources are available for equipment sizing, uh, the geoanalyst software, which I'll talk about here shortly, unit replacements if it's a you know, water source heat pump uh, or geothermal, and then uh, solar design where we can couple, especially with this air to water or geothermal, uh, we can couple a, a solar uh, design for either offsetting some of the electric use or even uh, net zero depending upon uh, what, what your objective is there. The software GeoAnalyst is what we use to actually calculate those graphs that Tim was showing. This allows you to put in your heat loss, heat gain calculations, and then you can choose the system that makes the most sense or multiple systems so that you can compare uh, what works the best in your particular area. The air to water unit has a special setup for selecting the size of the equipment, the type of system that you want. Is it radiant floor, fan coils, or both? what type of backup heating are you going to use, and what, what type of domestic hot water. Once you choose those and you have your heat loss, heat gain calculated, then we can get some actual operating costs. It can be kind of confusing when we have COPs and HSPFs and AFUEs, but if we plug that information into uh, GeoAnalyst, it will give us dollars rather than all those um, different um, ratings. This is a bin data-based software. So when you pick the city, it will automatically pull in the, the bin data. The bin data are five degree temperature bins on outdoor air temperature so that we know what, how many hours per year we are at each of those bins. So this happens to be Syracuse, I believe, at 22 degrees outside in that bin anyway. Uh, we have about 400 hours per year. So based upon the location, uh, you can really dial in exactly how this thing's going to perform. In this particular area, you can see there are an awful lot of hours. Um, in fact, all of the hours in this case, there's one hour at minus 13. This, this heat pump will not shut off at all, no matter how cold it gets. Um, and I guess that's, you know, it could be below minus 13, but at least from a design standpoint, it would be very, very unlikely. Uh, we only have one hour there, so the heat pump would run that entire time and provide us with how much capacity we can uh, expect from the heat pump versus how much backup we need. There's also a report that shows uh, operating costs. So now this takes all, those, all that information and puts it into dollars and cents. The field installations will give you a little bit of an idea here of, uh, of what the system looks like installed. In the upper left-hand corner, you can see the indoor module piped up. Uh, right below that are the solar, is a solar array that is uh, tied into the system so that we can offset a lot of that power. Then we have in the middle of the picture here a couple of outdoor units. The one at the top has a snow stand. It's a 12 or 18 inch, depending upon your climate. On the right-hand side, we have a couple of other pictures of outdoor units and an indoor module. Uh, the one just to the second from the left shows the TurboMax water heater and the fan coil that's designed for 120 degree water. So it's a nice looking system. Uh, it it uh, is designed for cold climates and, and will be a, a really nice fit for, um, for just about any application, really, uh, any climate, I should say. And back to you, Tim. Okay, thank you, Jeff. 
And uh, so what we'd like to be able to do is we've shared an awful lot within even 40, 45 minutes right now, but we wanted to make sure that you understand that it's not just what we want to present today, but we want to go deeper with you. And John Pendleton, our senior trainer, has actually, uh, through the help of our marketing department, come up with 10 videos. And there's a little short quiz that each need to be completed before you're able to move on. And we truly care about this industry. So before we allow product to hit the field or the marketplace, we, we are kind of using this as a prerequisite in order to be able to complete this 10 video tour, if you will, so that you've got a much better understanding and very familiar with this product when it shows up, how it's to be installed, as well as what you can expect out of the performance of this. So, you know, please check that out at entertechusa.com. Uh, click on Entertech University, and you will see an absolute ton of videos there ready to help you. And then we've also been able to provide even, again, our, our tech support design team that Jeff has just quickly run through as well. So please understand, we don't just want to sell equipment. We want to make sure that it's installed properly. You're happy. Your end user is happy. That's the goal from Entertech. So if I may, this is our last slide. Just as Jeff had mentioned earlier, all of our equipment, whether it's the geothermal equipment that we've been making since 2007 or our new air to water, as Jeff said, all run tested before it ever shows up on your job site or your location, proudly manufactured in Mitchell, South Dakota. We're very proud of that. Most of our competitors that we see in the air to water market space are coming in from overseas, and we are extremely proud of the people that we have on our Entertech team. And uh, we, we certainly welcome the opportunity, if you're ever through Mitchell, South Dakota, please reach out to us and we'll be happy to make sure you get a tour of our facility. But in the lower left-hand column, we also just want to share with you Entertech's journey to energy independence. Entertech truly stands for where energy meets technology. So we have not only all geothermal, in both of those locations, but specifically in our corporate location in the bottom left, which is in Greenville, Illinois, there's also 550 kW of solar PV on that, basically allowing us to be net zero in our research and design facility, as well as obviously that's where our senior staff is, marketing, um, accounting, everything else happens except manufacturing, which is only in Mitchell. So. Kyle, if it's okay, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Thank you all very, very much for joining Jeff Hammond and myself today. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, uh, Tim and Jeff, for a great presentation. And now, as we promised, the presenters will address a few questions. If you guys are ready, we'll uh, start plowing through these. Uh, first one up here is, is Roger. Is the condenser fan variable speed? Yes, it is. It's an ECM motor. It's uh, extremely quiet, so so it will ramp up and down as the compressor ramps up, ramps up and down, uh, or even based upon uh, the the conditions at the time. So uh, it will it's variable speed um, the entire time. Okay. Uh, next one, Rachel. What is the size of the outdoor and indoor units and water heater? We have two models. There's a uh, an O30, a two and a half ton, and an O60, a five ton. Um, th those are available, and the water heaters are available in 45 gallons or 65 gallons. Uh, Frank's got a question. Has this equipment been used in the commercial kitchen application using the heat from the space to heat water? Interesting. Well, we we could we would probably have a different product for that type of application if we wanted to use, um, you know, reuse some heat from the space. We might look at maybe a water-to-water -water unit, um, since this unit is using, um, you know, is, is an outdoor unit. Um, it's going to be pulling heat from the, from the outdoor um, condition. I'm not sure we we might, you know, really really overcool the space if we used it indoors. Five tons of of cooling might be um, substantial. I suppose if, if the kitchen is uh, really, really hot and really large, then that, that could actually be an interesting application 
it's not designed for that, but that doesn't mean it couldn't couldn't work. Anytime we can transfer heat instead of creating heat, it's definitely an advantage. So we probably should talk more about that. All right, uh, Leo's up next here. What happens to the outdoor unit in the event of a day or two long power outage? Um, and jump in, Tim, if you want to take any of these questions. Um, if You're there's on a, a roll. power outage, on, my friend. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> if there is a power outage, then uh, we really don't have any concerns as long as the system is installed, uh, you know, per the at the installation manual. We always want to make sure we have antifreeze in the piping um, that's adequate um, from a burst uh, temperature standpoint. We wouldn't want to over antifreeze the system so that we have too much uh, viscosity at cold temperatures. So we typically look at burst temperature. As long as it has adequate antifreeze, then even if the power's off for a couple of days, uh, we're still in good shape. And depending upon which way you go, the all-electric version or the dual fuel version, um, you, you may or may not have um, uh, uh, the boiler operating, but you'd have to have some sort of generator to run your pumps in, in that type of a situation. So it would not be a problem if it's installed according to the installation manual. All right. Does Entertech have product offerings for large commercial and institutional installations? Well, the five ton is the largest uh, unit size in, in air to water. You could certainly use multiple uh, five ton units, but there isn't anything at this point that's larger than five tons. And there may be some other um, opportunities depending upon the, the um, application where you might mix some air to water and water to water. Uh, we'd have to look at the application itself, but at this point, five ton is our largest on the air to water product. Okay, Brian is asking, how is the outdoor piping protected from freezing? Well, we'll use an antifreeze, typically propylene glycol, and uh, we'll make sure that we have that designed for the particular location based upon the, the minimum outdoor temperature. Okay, um, can the unit be used for domestic hot water only? Certainly. Makes it easy there. Would it be possible to provide multiple output taps for different temperature requirements? Well, that's actually built into it, really. Um, the, there, there are two settings, uh, three if you count cooling. Uh, there's, there's a water heating setting, so what is being sent over to the TurboMax water heater has a set point. There's a set point for the radiant floor, which is based upon outdoor temperature, so it's the outdoor temperature reset curve. There's also a set point for fan coil heating, and uh, that is is fixed at 120 degrees, so we'd want to match it with an Intertech fan coil or air handler. Uh, and then the cooling uh, temperature you, you can set as well for chilled water going through a fan coil. So that's one of the advantages of having this package is that all of that is built into the indoor module. Hey, Malcolm is asking, what refrigerant is used in the system? It's R410A. All right. Is there a separation between the building's water loop and the water loop between the outdoor unit and indoor unit? Not generally. Normally you have the, uh, the water running from the outdoor unit uh, through the indoor unit into the hydronic system. Um, you could certainly add a heat exchanger if you wanted to, but then that you would need another pump and uh, you'd lose some efficiency there. So. We generally try, try to stay with the same fluid um, running through the system as we do to the outdoor unit. Okay, great. How well does the system work for existing residential replacement remodel? It can work really well for replacement. Um, we would have to look at the convectors, um, especially if we have you know, cast iron radiators or baseboard heat or something like that it's possible that we may not have high enough temperature with the heat pump, but it's also possible that they have upgraded their windows and insulation and so forth, and maybe we don't need as much capacity, or we could possibly add some additional uh, radiation surface. 
So it, it generally is, is a really good fit. If they have an existing boiler, um, they, they might, may want to continue to use that boiler as backup. And uh, if it's forced air, then we could certainly replace the, the furnace or heat pump uh, with a hydronic air handler and, and we could stay with the ductwork. Um, if it happens to not have ductwork, we can couple it with um, ductless um, indoor units and use chilled water and hot water there. So it's it's really ideal for retrofits because of the flexibility with the hydronic applications. The next one up here is from Chris. Does the antifreeze flow through the entire water system or just the indoor-outdoor connection? The antifreeze would fly, flow through the entire system unless a heat exchanger uh, were introduced. So you would you would have antifreeze going from the outdoor unit to the indoor unit, and the indoor unit really is um, is just a, a switch gear, I guess, for lack of better words. The, the zone valves switch between the hot water tank and the uh, hydronic heating and cooling system. So you would generally have the same water going through the entire system as you would uh, going from the outdoor to the indoor unit. If for some reason uh, that wasn't desirable, a heat exchanger could be added on the other side of the indoor module, and uh, and then you would have different fluids uh, on the hydronic side than on the uh, unit side. But it definitely needs antifreeze between the indoor and the outdoor unit. Okay, Drew's asking, can you stack units for a large multifamily project? Sure. Yeah, you might need multiple units, but uh, it would actually work well having, uh, you know, one central mechanical room, so to speak. Uh, Rodney, have you used this product for pool heating? I don't know if we have any applications today that we've used it with pool heating. We certainly have used a lot of water-to-water -water heat pumps for pool heating, and it would apply the same way, really. It would just be another hot water zone. We would have to have a titanium plate heat exchanger so that we didn't have pool water going through the unit, but uh, it could be used for pool heating just as another heating zone. They must really like this information because they're coming up with multiple uh, <laughs> ways to use what you're, uh, what you're talking about. That's definitely a good sign, guys. Uh, next one up here from Tony. Does a load shedding device void warranty on these units? Well, it has load shedding built into the control. So all we need is a contact closure from the utility, and uh, load shedding will then disable the uh, compressor and electric heat if it has it. In that point, then um, we would we would bring on whatever backup source they have. A lot, a lot of the dual fuel uh, utility programs would require some sort of a fossil fuel backup, maybe a boiler in this case. So when we get a load shed signal, it would just uh, disable the compressor, but it would still allow the pump to run uh, along with the boiler. So it, it wouldn't void the warranty, I guess, to answer the question, as long as it's, uh, you know, the, the load shed control that's built into the indoor module is used. Okay, Christian's saying, I might not have caught this, but is this based on localized average electric and national gas rates? Uh, I, I take it he's, he's talking about Tim's presentation. Th those are local rates. All right. We'll get you out. Uh, you've been very, uh, very good with these questions, and uh, we appreciate it. So we'll get you out on this one. At the high water temps, is there, an, is there a problem with premature compressor failure, as you would with some ground source equipment? Is that a concern? It's really not a concern as long as uh, we're, we're limiting the output to 135 degrees, which happens to be the maximum selection you could make anyway. Uh, the vapor injection is actually cooling that compressor when it's running at those high uh, condenser temperatures and low evaporator temperatures. So, in fact, the vapor injection is going to help prolong the life of, of the unit, and it's, it's really designed for that up to 135 degree Fahrenheit uh, temperature. It, it's just an interesting design in that uh, it's it's you know keeping that compressor cool so that it can operate uh, for ex extended period of time at high condenser temperatures. All righty, well we are out of time. Really appreciate the uh, presentation, Tim and Jeff, uh, and all the questions we got. It was a great uh, great event, and of course we uh, we want to thank our sponsor Entertech um, for providing this great information. If you have any additional questions or comments. 
please don't hesitate to click the Email Us button on the console. As you exit today's webinar, please take a couple of minutes to complete our survey. We strongly welcome your detailed comments. Also visit achrnews.com backslash webinars for the archive of this presentation as well as information about our upcoming events. We appreciate your time and hope you found this webinar to be a valuable experience. Enjoy the remainder of your day, everybody.